Section 1 of Wreck of the Golden Mary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Carson. Wreck of the Golden Mary by Charles Dickens. Section 1. The Wreck. I was apprenticed to the sea when I was twelve years old and I have encountered a great deal of rough weather, both literal and metaphorical. It has always been my opinion, since I first possessed such a thing as an opinion, that the man who knows only one subject is next tiresome to the man who knows no subject. Therefore, in the course of my life, I have taught myself whatever I could, and although I am not an educated man, I am able i am thankful to say to have an intelligent interest in most things a person might suppose from reading the above that i am in the habit of holding forth about number one that is not the case just as if i was to come into a room among strangers and must either be introduced or introduce myself so i have taken the liberty of passing these few remarks simply and plainly that it may be known who and what i am I will add no more of the sort than that my name is William George Ravender, that I was born at Penrith half a year after my father was drowned, and that I am on the second day of this present blessed Christmas week of one thousand eight hundred and fifty-six, fifty-six years of age. When the rumor first went flying up and down that there was gold in California, which, as most people know, was before it was discovered in the British colony of Australia, I was in the West Indies, trading among the islands. Being in command, and likewise part owner of a small schooner, I had my work cut out for me, and I was doing it. Consequently, gold in California was no business of mine. But by the time when I came home to England again, the thing was as clear as your hand held up before you at noonday. There was Californian gold in the museums and in the goldsmiths' shops, and the very first time I went upon change I met a friend of mine, a seafaring man like myself, with a California nugget hanging to his watch-chain. I handled it. It was as like a peeled walnut, with bits unevenly broken off here and there, and then electrotyped all over as ever I saw anything in my life. I am a single man, she was too good for this world and for me, and she died six weeks before our marriage day. So when I am ashore I live in my house at Poplar. My house at Poplar is taken care of and kept shipshape by an old lady who was my mother's maid before I was born. She is as handsome and as upright as any old lady in the world. She is as fond of me as if she had ever had an only son, and I was he. Well do I know, wherever I sail, that she never lays down her head at night without having said, Merciful Lord, bless and preserve William George Ravender, and send him safe home through Christ our Saviour. I have thought of it in many a dangerous moment, when it has done me no harm, I am sure. In my house at Poplar, along with this old lady, I lived quiet for best part of a year. Having had a long spell of it among the islands, and having, which was very uncommon in me, taken the fever rather badly. At last, being strong and hearty, and having read every book I could lay hold of, right out I was walking down Leadenhall Street in the city of London, thinking of turning to again, when I met what I call Smithick and Watersby of Liverpool. I chanced to lift my eyes from taking in a ship's chronometer in a window, and I saw him bearing down upon me head on. It is, personally, neither Smithick nor Watersby that I here mention, nor was I ever acquainted with any man of either of those names nor do I think that there has been any one of either of those names in that Liverpool house for years back. But it is in reality the house itself that I refer to, and a wiser merchant or a truer gentleman never stepped. My dear Captain Ravender, says he, of all the men on earth I wanted to see you most. 
I was on my way to you. Well, says I, that looks as if you were to see me, don't it? With that I put my arm in his, and we walked on towards the Royal Exchange, and when we got there, walked up and down at the back of it, where the clock tower is. We walked an hour and more, for he had much to say to me. He had a scheme for chartering a new ship of their own to take out cargo to the diggers and emigrants in California, and to buy and bring back gold. Into the particulars of that scheme I will not enter, and I have no right to enter. All I say of it is that it was a very original one, a very fine one, a very sound one, and a very lucrative one beyond doubt. He imparted to me as freely as if I had been a part of himself. After doing so, he made me the handsomest sharing offer that ever was made to me, boy or man, or I believe to any other captain in the merchant navy, and he took this round turn to finish with. Ravender, you are well aware that the lawlessness of that coast and country at present is as special as the circumstances in which it is placed. Crews of vessels outward bound desert as soon as they make the land. Crews of vessels homeward bound ship at enormous wages, with the express intention of murdering the captain and seizing the gold freight. No man can trust another, and the devil seems let loose. Now, says he, you know my opinion of you, and you know I am only expressing it, and with no singularity, when I tell you that you are almost the only man on whose integrity, discretion, and energy, etc., etc. For I don't want to repeat what he said, though I was and am sensible of it. Notwithstanding my being, as I have mentioned, quite ready for a voyage, still I had some doubts of this voyage. Of course I knew, without being told, that there were peculiar difficulties and dangers in it, a long way over and above those which attend all voyages. It must not be supposed that I was afraid to face them. But in my opinion a man has no manly motive or sustainment in his own breast for facing dangers unless he has well considered what they are and is able quietly to say to himself, None of these perils can now take me by surprise. I shall know what to do for the best in any of them. All the rest lies in the higher and greater hands to which I humbly commit myself. On this principle I have so attentively considered, regarding it as my duty, all the hazards I have ever been able to think of in the ordinary way of storm, shipwreck, and fire at sea that I hope I should be prepared to do, in any of those cases, whatever could be done, to save the lives entrusted to my charge. As I was thoughtful, my good friend proposed that he should leave me to walk there as long as I liked, and that I should dine with him by and by at his club in Pell-Mell. I accepted the invitation, and I walked up and down there, quarter-deck fashion, a matter of a couple of hours now and then looking up at the weathercock as I might have looked up aloft, and now and then taking a look into Cornhill as I might have taken a look over the side. All dinner time and all after dinner time we talked it over again. I gave him my views of his plan, and he very much approved of the same. I told him I had nearly decided, but not quite. Well, well, says he, Come down to Liverpool tomorrow with me and see the Golden Mary. I liked the name. Her name was Mary, and she was Golden, if Golden stands for good. So I began to feel that it was almost done when I said I would go to Liverpool. On the next morning but one we were on board the Golden Mary. I might have known from his asking me to come down and see her what she was. I declare her to have been the completest and most exquisite beauty that ever I set my eyes upon. We had inspected every timber in her, and had come back to the gangway to go ashore from the dock basin, when I put out my hand to my friend. Touch upon it, says I, and touch heartily. I take command of this ship, and I am hers and yours, if I can get John Steadyman for my chief mate. John Steadyman had sailed with me four voyages. The first voyage John was third mate, out to China, 
and came home second. The other three voyages he was my first officer. At this time of chartering the Golden Mary he was aged thirty-two, a brisk, bright, blue-eyed fellow, a very neat figure, and rather under the middle size, never out of the way and never in it, a face that pleased everybody and that all children took to, a habit of going about singing as cheerily as a blackbird and a perfect sailor. We were in one of those Liverpool hackney coaches in less than a minute, and we cruised about in her upwards of three hours looking for John. John had come home from Van Diemen's land barely a month before, and I had heard of him as taking a frisk in Liverpool. We asked after him among many other places at the two boarding-houses he was fondest of, and we found he had had a week's spell at each of them, but he had gone here and gone there, and had set off to lay out on the main to gallant yard of the highest Welsh mountain. So we had told the people of the house. And where he might be then, or when he might come back, nobody could tell us. But it was surprising, to be sure, to see how every face brightened the moment there was mention made of the name of Mr. Steadyman. We were taken aback at meeting with no better luck, and we had worship and put our head for my friends. When, as we were jogging through the streets, I clapped my hands on John himself, coming out of a toy shop. He was carrying a little boy and conducting two uncommon pretty women to their coach, and he told me afterwards that he had never in his life seen one of the three before, but that he was so taken with them on looking in at the toy shop while they were buying the child a cranky Noah's Ark very much down by the head that he had gone in and asked the lady's permission to treat him to a tolerably correct cutter there was in the window in order that such a handsome boy might not grow up with a lubberly idea of naval architecture we stood off and on until the ladies' coachman began to give way, and then we hailed John. On his coming aboard of us I told him, very gravely, what I had said to my friend. It struck him, as he said himself, amidships. He was quite shaken by it. Captain Ravender, said John Steadyman's words, such an opinion from you is true commendation, and I'll sail round the world with you for twenty years if you hoist the signal and stand by you forever. And now indeed I felt that it was done, and that the Golden Mary was afloat. Grass never grew yet under the feet of Smithick and Watersby. The riggers were out of that ship in a fortnight's time, and we had begun taking in cargo. John was always aboard, seeing everything stowed with his own eyes, and whenever I went aboard myself early or late, whether he was below in the hold or on deck at the hatchway or overhauling his cabin, nailing up pictures in it of the blush roses of England, the bluebells of Scotland, and the female shamrock of Ireland. Of a certainty I heard John singing like a blackbird. We had room for twenty passengers. Our sailing advertisement was no sooner out than we might have taken these twenty times over. In entering our men, I and John both together picked them, and we entered none but good hands, as good as were to be found in that port. And so in a good ship of the best build, well-owned, well-arranged, well-officered, well-manned, well-found in all respects, we parted with our pilot at a quarter past four o'clock in the afternoon of the 7th of March, 1851, and stood with a fair wind out to sea. It may be easily believed that up to that time I had had no leisure to be intimate with my passengers. The most of them were then in their berths seasick. However, in going among them, telling them what was good for them, persuading them not to be there, but to come up on deck and feel the breeze, and in rousing them with a joke or a comfortable word, I made acquaintance with them perhaps in a more friendly and confidential way from the first than I might have done at the cabin table. Of my passengers I need only particularize, just at present, a bright-eyed, blooming young wife, who was going out to join her husband in California, 
taking with her their only child, a little girl of three years old, whom he had never seen. A sedate young woman in black, some five years older, about thirty as I should say, who was going out to join a brother, and an old gentleman, a good deal like a hawk if his eyes had been better and not so red, who was always talking, morning, noon, and night, about the gold discovery. But whether he was making the voyage, thinking his old arms could dig for gold, or whether his speculation was to buy it, or to barter for it, or to cheat for it, or to snatch it anyhow from other people, was his secret. He kept his secret. These three and the child were the soonest well. The child was a most engaging child, to be sure, and very fond of me, though I am bound to admit that John Steadyman and I were born on her pretty little books in reverse order, and that he was captain there and I was mate. It was beautiful to watch her with John, and it was beautiful to watch John with her. Few would have thought it possible to see John playing at Bo Peep round the mast, that he was the man who had caught up an iron bar and struck a melee, and a Maltese dead, as they were gliding with their knives down the cabin stairs aboard the bark Old England, when the captain lay ill in his cot off Sugar Point. But he was, and give him his back against a bulwark, he would have done the same by half a dozen of them. The name of the young mother was Mrs. Athelfield, the name of the young lady in black was Miss Coleshaw, and the name of the old gentleman was Mr. Rox. As the child had a quantity of shining fair hair, clustering in curls all about her face, and as her name was Lucy, Steadyman gave her the name of the Golden Lucy. So we had the Golden Lucy and the Golden Mary, and John kept up the idea to that extent as he and the child went playing about the decks, that I believe she used to think the ship was alive somehow, a sister or companion going to the same place as herself. She liked to be by the wheel, and in fine weather I have often stood by the man whose trick it was at the wheel, only to hear her sitting near my feet talking to the ship. Never had a child such a doll before, I suppose. But she made a doll of the Golden Mary, and used to dress her up by tying ribbons and little bits of finery to the belaying pins, and nobody ever moved them, unless it was to save them from being blown away. Of course I took charge of the two young women, and I called them my dear, and they never minded, knowing that whatever I said was said in a fatherly and protecting spirit. I gave them their places on each side of me at dinner, Mrs. Atherfield on my right and Miss Coleshaw on my left, and I directed the unmarried lady to serve out the breakfast and the married lady to serve out the tea. Likewise I said to my black steward in their presence, Tom Snow, these two ladies are equally the mistresses of this house, and do you obey their orders equally? At which Tom laughed, and they all laughed. Old Mr. Rocks was not a pleasant man to look at, nor yet to talk to, or to be with, for no one could help seeing that he was a sordid and selfish character, and that he had warped further and further out of the strait with time. Not but what he was on his best behavior with us, as everybody was, for we had no bickering among us, forward or aft. I only mean to say he was not the man one would have chosen for a messmate. If choice there had been, one might even have gone a few points out of one's course to say, no, not him. But there was one curious inconsistency in Mr. Rocks. That was that he took an astonishing interest in the child. He looked, and I may add, he was one of the last men to care at all for a child, or to care much for any human creature. Still, he went so far as to be habitually uneasy if the child was long on deck out of his sight. He was always afraid of her falling overboard, or falling down a hatchway, or of a block, or what not coming down upon her from the rigging in the working of the ship, or of her getting some hurt or other. He used to look at her and touch her as if she was something precious to him. He was always solicitous about her not injuring her health, and constantly entreated her mother to be careful of it.
This was so much the more curious, because the child did not like him, but used to shrink away from him, and would not even put her hand out to him without coaxing from others. I believe that every soul on board frequently noticed this, and not one of us understood it. However, it was such a plain fact that John Steadyman said more than once, when old Mr. Rox was not within earshot, that if the Golden Mary felt a tenderness for the dear old gentleman she carried in her lap, she must be bitterly jealous of the Golden Lucy. Before I go any further with this narrative, I will state that our ship was a bark of three hundred tons, carrying a crew of eighteen men, a second mate in addition to John, a carpenter, an armorer or smith, and two apprentices, one a Scotch boy, poor little fellow. We had three boats, the long boat capable of carrying twenty-five men, the cutter capable of carrying fifteen, and the surf boat capable of carrying ten. I put down the capacity of these boats according to the numbers they were really meant to hold. We had tastes of bad weather and headwinds, of course, but on the whole we had as fine a run as any reasonable man could expect for sixty days. I then began to enter two remarks in the ship's log and in my journal. First, that there was an unusual and amazing quantity of ice. Second, that the nights were most wonderfully dark, in spite of the ice. For five days and a half it seemed quite useless and hopeless to alter the ship's course so as to stand out of the way of this ice. I made what southing I could, but all that time we were beset by it. Mrs. Atherfield, after standing by me on the deck once, looking for some time in an odd manner, at the great bergs that surrounded us, said in a whisper, Oh, Captain Ravender, it looks as if the whole solid earth had changed into ice and broken up. I said to her, laughing, I don't wonder that it does, to your inexperienced eyes, my dear, but I have never seen a twentieth part of the quantity, and in reality I was pretty much of her opinion. However, at two p.m. on the afternoon of the sixth day, that is to say, when we were sixty-six days out, John Steadyman, who had gone aloft, sang out from the top that the sea was clear ahead. Before four p.m. a strong breeze springing up right astern, we were in open water at sunset, the breeze then freshening into half a gale of wind, and the Golden Mary being a very fast sailor, we went before the wind merrily all night. I had thought it impossible that it could be darker than it had been until the sun, moon, and stars should fall out of the heavens and time should be destroyed, but it had been next to light in comparison with what it was now. The darkness was so profound that looking into it was painful and oppressive, like looking without a ray of light into a dense black bandage put as close before the eyes as it could be without touching them. I doubled the lookout, and John and I stood in the bow side by side, never leaving it all night. Yet I should no more have known that he was near me when he was silent, without putting out my arm and touching him, than I should if he had turned in and been fast asleep below. We were not so much looking out, all of us, as listening to the utmost, both with our eyes and ears. Next day I found that the mercury in the barometer, which had risen steadily since we cleared the ice, remained steady. I had had very good observations, with now and then the interruption of a day or so, since our departure. I got the sun at noon, and found that we were at latitude 58 degrees south, longitude 60 degrees west, off New South Shetland, in the neighborhood of Cape Horn. We were sixty-seven days out that day. The ship's reckoning was accurately worked and made up. The ship did her duty admirably. All on board were well, and all hands were as smart, efficient, and contented as it was possible to be. When the night came on again as dark as before, it was the eighth night I had been on deck. Nor had I taken more than a very little sleep in the daytime my station being always near the helm, 
and often at it while we were among the ice. Few but those who have tried it can imagine the difficulty and pain of only keeping the eyes open, physically open, under such circumstances, in such darkness. They get struck by the darkness and blinded by the darkness. They make patterns in it and they flash in it as if they had gone out of your head to look at you. On the turn of midnight, John Steadyman, who was alert and fresh, for I had always made him turn in by day, said to me, Captain Ravender, I entreat you to go below. I am sure you can hardly stand, and your voice is getting weak, sir. Go below and take a little rest. I'll call you if a block chafes. I said to John in answer, Well, well, John, let us wait till the turn of one o'clock before we talk about that. I had just had one of the ship's lanterns held up that I might see how the night went by my watch, and it was then twenty minutes after twelve. At five minutes before one, John sang out to the boy to bring the lantern again, and when I told him once more what the time was, entreated and prayed of me to go below. Captain Ravender, says he, all's well, we can't afford to have you laid up for a single hour, and I respectfully and earnestly beg of you to go below. The end of it was that I agreed to do so, on the understanding that if I failed to come up of my own accord, within three hours I was to be punctually called. Having settled that, I left John in charge. But I called him to me once afterwards to ask him a question. I had been to look at the barometer, and had seen the mercury still perfectly steady, and had come up the companion again to take a last look about me if I can use such a word in reference to such darkness, when I thought that the waves, as the golden Mary parted them and shook them off, had a hollow sound in them, something that I fancied was a rather unusual reverberation. I was standing by the quarter-deck rail on the starboard side when I called John aft to me and bade him listen. He did so with the greatest attention. Turning to me, he then said, Rely upon it, Captain Ravender. You have been without rest too long, and the novelty is only in the state of your sense of hearing. I thought so, too, by that time, and I think so now, though I can never know for absolute certain in this world whether it was or not. When I left John Steadyman in charge, the ship was still going at a great rate through the water. The wind still blew right astern, though she was making great way, she was under shortened sail, and had no more than she could easily carry. All was snug, and nothing complained. There was a pretty sea running, but not a very high sea neither, nor at all a confused one. I turned in, as we seamen say, all standing. The meaning of that is, I did not pull my clothes off, no, not even so much as my coat, though I did my shoes, for my feet were badly swelled with the deck. There was a little swing lamp alight in my cabin. I thought, as I looked at it before shutting my eyes, that I was so tired of darkness and troubled by darkness that I could have gone to sleep best in the midst of a million of flaming gaslights. That was the last thought I had before I went off, except the prevailing thought that I should not be able to get to sleep at all. I dreamt that I was back at Penrith again and was trying to get round the church which had altered its shape very much since I last saw it, and was cloven all down the middle of the steeple in a most singular manner. Why I wanted to get round the church I don't know, but I was as anxious to do it as if my life depended on it. Indeed, I believe it did in the dream. For all that I could not get round the church. I was still trying, when I came against it with a violent shock, and was flung out of my cot against the ship's side. Shrieks and a terrific outcry struck me far harder than the bruising timbers, and amidst sounds of grinding and crashing, and a heavy rushing and breaking of water sounds, I understood too well, I made my way on deck. It was not an easy thing to do for the ship heeled over frightfully, and was beating in a furious manner. I could not see the men as I went forward, but I could hear that they were hauling in sail in disorder. 
I had my trumpet in my hand, and after directing and encouraging them in this till it was done, I hailed first John Steadyman, and then my second mate, Mr. William Rames. Both answered clearly and steadily. Now I had practiced them and all my crew, as I have ever made it a custom to practice all who sail with me, to take certain stations and wait my orders in case of any unexpected crisis. When my voice was heard hailing and their voices were heard answering, I was aware, through all the noises of the ship and sea, and all the crying of the passengers below, that there was a pause. "'Are you ready, Rames?' "'Aye, aye, sir. Then light up, for God's sake.' In a moment he and another were burning blue lights, and the ship and all on board seemed to be enclosed in a mist of light under a great black dome. The light shone up so high that I could see the huge iceberg upon which we had struck, cloven at the top and down the middle, exactly like Penrith Church in my dream. At the same moment I could see the watch, last relieved, crowding up and down on deck. I could see Mrs. Atherfield and Miss Colshaw thrown about on the top of the companion as they struggled to bring the child up from below. I could see that the masts were going with the shock and the beating of the ship. I could see the frightful breach stove in on the starboard side, half the length of the vessel, and the sheathing and timbers spiriting up. I could see that the cutter was disabled in a wreck of broken fragments, and I could see every eye turned upon me. It is my belief that if there had been ten thousand eyes there, I should have seen them all with their different looks, and all this in a moment. But you must consider what a moment. I saw the men, as they looked at me, fall towards their appointed stations like good men and true. If she had not righted, they could have done very little there or anywhere but die. Not that it is little for a man to die at his post. I mean they could have done nothing to save the passengers and themselves. Happily, however, the violence of the shock with which we had so determinedly borne down direct on that fatal iceberg, as if it had been our destination instead of our destruction, had so smashed and pounded the ship that she got off in this same instant and righted. I did not want the carpenter to tell me she was filling and going down. I could see and hear that. I gave Rames the word to lower the longboat and the surf-boat, and I myself told off the men for each duty. Not one hung back or came before the other. I now whispered to John Steadyman, John, I stand at the gangway here to see every soul on board safe over the side. You shall have the next post of honor, and shall be the last but one to leave the ship. Bring up the passengers, and range them behind me, and put what provision and water you can got at in the boats. Cast your eyes forward, John, and you'll see you have not a moment to lose." My noble fellows got the boats over the side as orderly as I ever saw boats lowered with any sea running, and when they were launched two or three of the nearest men in them as they held on, rising and falling with the swell, called out, looking up at me, Captain Ravender, if anything goes wrong with us and you are saved, remember we stood by you. We'll all stand by one another ashore, yet please God, my lads, says I, Hold on bravely, and be tender with the women. The women were an example to us. They trembled very much, but they were quiet and perfectly collected. Kiss me, Captain Ravender, said Mrs. Atherfield, and God in heaven bless you, you good man. My dear, says I, those words are better for me than a lifeboat. I held her child in my arms till she was in the boat, and then kissed the child and handed her safe down. I now said to the people in her, you have got your freight, my lads, all but me, and I am not coming yet a while. Pull away from the ship and keep off. That was the longboat. Old Mr. Rarks was one of her complement, and he was the only passenger who had greatly misbehaved since the ship struck. Others had been a little wild, which was not to be wondered at, and not very blamable, but he had made a lamentation and uproar which it was dangerous for the people to hear, 
as there is always contagion in weakness and selfishness. His incessant cry had been that he must not be separated from the child, that he couldn't see the child, and that he and the child must go together. He had even tried to wrest the child out of my arms, that he might keep her in his. Mr. Rox, said I to him when it came to that, I have a loaded pistol in my pocket, and if you don't stand out of the gangway and keep perfectly quiet, I shall shoot you through the heart if you have got one. Says he, You won't do murder, Captain Ravender. No, sir, says I, I won't murder forty-four people to humor you, but I'll shoot you to save them. After that he was quiet and stood shivering a little way off, until I named him to go over the side. The long-boat being cast off, the surf-boat was soon filled. There only remained, aboard the Golden Mary, John Mullion, the man who had kept on burning the blue lights, and who had lighted every new one at every old one before it went out, as quietly as if he had been at an illumination. John Steadyman and myself. I hurried those two into the surf-boat, called to them to keep off, and waited with a grateful and relieved heart for the long-boat to come and take me in, if she could. I looked at my watch, and it showed me, by blue light, two minutes past two. They lost no time. As soon as she was near enough, I swung myself into her, and called to the men. With a will, lads, she's reeling. We were not an inch too far out of the inner vortex of her going down, when, by the blue light which John Mullion still burned in the bow of the surf-boat, we saw her lurch and plunge to the bottom head foremost. The child cried, weeping wildly, Oh, the dear Golden Mary, oh, look at her, save her, save the poor Golden Mary. And then the light burnt out, and the black dome seemed to come down upon us. I suppose if we had all stood atop of a mountain, and seen the whole remainder of the world sink away from under us, we could hardly have felt more shocked and solitary than we did when we knew we were alone on the wide ocean, and that the beautiful ship in which most of us had been securely asleep within half an hour was gone for ever. There was an awful silence in our boat, and such a kind of palsy on the rowers and the man at the rudder, that I felt they were scarcely keeping her before the sea. I spoke out then, and said, Let every one here thank the Lord for our preservation. All the voices answered, even the child's, We thank the Lord. I then said the Lord's Prayer, and all hands said it after me with a solemn murmuring. Then I gave the word, Cheerily, O men, cheerily, and I felt that they were handling the boat again as a boat ought to be handled. The surf-boat now burnt another blue light to show us where they were, and we made for her, and laid ourselves as nearly alongside of her as we dared. I had always kept my boats with a coil or two of good stout stuff in each of them, so both boats had a rope at hand. We made a shift, with much labor and trouble, to get near enough to one another to divide the blue lights. They were no use after that night, for the sea-water soon got at them, and to get a tow-rope out between us. All night long we kept together, sometimes obliged to cast off the rope, and sometimes getting it out again, and all of us wearying for the morning, which appeared so long in coming that old Mr. Rox screamed out in spite of his fears of me, the world is drawing to an end, and the sun will never rise any more. When the day broke, I found that we were all huddled together in a miserable manner. We were deep in the water, being, as I found on mustering, thirty-one in number, or at least six too many. In the surf-boat they were fourteen in number, being at least four too many. The first thing I did was to get myself passed to the rudder, which I took from that time, and to get Mrs. Atherfield, her child, and Miss Colshaw, passed on to sit next me. As to old Mr. Rox, I put him in the bow as far from us as I could, and I put some of the best men near us, in order that if I should drop there might be a skilful hand ready to take the helm. The sea moderating as the sun came up, though the sky was cloudy and wild, we spoke the other boat 
to know what stores they had and to overhaul what we had. I had a compass in my pocket, a small telescope, a double-barreled pistol, a knife, and a firebox and matches. Most of my men had knives, and some had a little tobacco, some a pipe as well. We had a mug among us, and an iron spoon. As to provisions, there were in my boat two bags of biscuit, one piece of raw beef, one piece of raw pork, a bag of coffee, roasted but not ground, thrown in, I imagine, by mistake for something else, two small casks of water, and about half gallon of rum in a keg. The surf boat, having rather more rum than we, and fewer to drink it, gave us, as I estimated, another quart into our keg. In return we gave them three double handfuls of coffee tied up in a piece of handkerchief. They reported that they had aboard, besides, a bag of biscuit, a piece of beef, a small cask of water, a small box of lemons, and a Dutch cheese. It took a long time to make these exchanges, and they were not made without risk to both parties, the sea running quite high enough to make our approaching near to one another very hazardous. In the bundle with the coffee I conveyed to John Steadyman, who had a ship's compass with him, a paper written in pencil and torn from my pocket-book, containing the course I meant to steer in the hope of making land or being picked up by some vessel. I say in the hope though I had little hope of either deliverance. I then sang out to him, so as all might hear, that if we two boats could live or die together, we would, but that if we should be parted by the weather, and join company no more, they should have our prayers and blessings, and we asked for theirs. We then gave them three cheers, which they returned, and I saw the men's heads droop in both boats as they fell to their oars again. These arrangements had occupied the general attention advantageously for all, though, as I expressed in the last sentence, they ended in a sorrowful feeling. I now said a few words to my fellow voyagers on the subject of the small stock of food on which our lives depended if they were preserved from the great deep, and on the rigid necessity of our eking it out in the most frugal manner. One and all replied that whatever allowance I thought best to lay down should be strictly kept to. We made a pair of scales out of a thin scrap of iron plating and some twine, and I got together for weights such of the heaviest buttons among us as I calculated made up some fraction over two ounces. This was the allowance of solid food served out once a day to each, from that time to the end with the addition of a coffee berry, or sometimes half a one, when the weather was very fair for breakfast. We had nothing else whatever, but half a pint of water each per day, and sometimes, when we were coldest and weakest, a teaspoonful of rum each, served out as a dram. I know how learnedly it can be shown that rum is poison, but I also know that in this case as in all similar cases I have ever read of, which are numerous, no words can express the comfort and support derived from it. Nor have I the least doubt that it saved the lives of far more than half our number. Having mentioned half a pint of water as our daily allowance, I ought to observe that sometimes we had less, and sometimes we had more, for much rain fell, and we caught it in a canvas stretched for the purpose. Thus at that tempestuous time of the year, and in that tempestuous part of the world, we shipwrecked people rose and fell with the waves. It is not my intention to relate, if I can avoid it, such circumstances appertaining to our doleful condition, as have been better told in many other narratives of the kind, than I can be expected to tell them. I will only note, in so many passing words, that day after day and night after night we received the sea upon our backs to prevent it from swamping the boat, that one party was always kept bailing, and that every hat and cap among us soon got worn out, though patched up fifty times, as the only vessel we had for that service, that another party lay down in the bottom of the boat while a third rowed, 
and that we were soon all in boils and blisters and rags. End of section one. Recording by James Carson. Section two of Wreck of the Golden Mary by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James Carson. The other boat was a source of such anxious interest to all of us that I used to wonder whether, if we were saved, the time could ever come when the survivors of this boat of ours could be at all indifferent to the fortunes of the survivors in that. We got out a tow rope whenever the weather permitted, but that did not often happen and how we two parties kept within the same horizon as we did, he who mercifully permitted it to be so for our consolation only knows. I never shall forget the looks with which when the morning light came we used to gaze about us over the stormy waters for the other boat. We once parted company for seventy-two hours, and we believed them to have gone down as they did us. The joy on both sides when we came within view of one another again had something in a manner divine in it. Each was so forgetful of individual suffering, in tears of delight and sympathy for the people in the other boat. I have been wanting to get round to the individual or personal part of my subject, as I call it, and the foregoing incident puts me in the right way. The patience and good disposition aboard of us was wonderful. I was not surprised by it in the women, for all men born of women know what great qualities they will show when men will fail. But I own I was a little surprised by it in some of the men. Among one and thirty people assembled at the best of times, there will usually, I should say, be two or three uncertain tempers. I knew that I had more than one rough temper with me among my own people, for I had chosen those for the longboat that I might have them under my eye. But they softened under their misery, and were as considerate of the ladies and as compassionate of the child as the best among us or among men. They could not have been more so. I heard scarcely any complaining. The party lying down would moan a good deal in their sleep, and I would often notice a man, not always the same man, it is to be understood, but nearly all of them at one time or another, sitting moaning at his oar, or in his place as he looked mistily over the sea. When it happened to be long before I could catch his eye, he would go on moaning all the time in the smallest manner, but when our looks met he would brighten and leave off. I almost always got the impression that he did not know what sound he had been making, but that he thought he had been humming a tune. Our sufferings from cold and wet were far greater than our sufferings from hunger. We managed to keep the child warm, but I doubt if any one else among us ever was warm for five minutes together and the shivering and the chattering of teeth were sad to hear. The child cried a little at first for her lost playfellow, the Golden Mary, but hardly ever whimpered afterwards. And when the state of the weather made it possible, she used now and then to be held up in the arms of some of us to look over the sea for John Steadyman's boat. I see the golden hair and the innocent face now, between me and the driving clouds, like an angel going to fly away. It had happened on the second day, towards night, that Mrs. Atherfield, in getting little Lucy to sleep, sang her a song. She had a soft, melodious voice, and when she had finished it, our people up and begged for another. She sang them another, and after it had fallen dark, ended with the evening hymn. From that time, whenever anything could be heard above the sea and wind, and while she had any voice left, nothing would serve the people but that she should sing at sunset. She always did, and always ended with the evening hymn. We mostly took up the last line and shed tears when it was done, but not miserably. 
We had a prayer night and morning also when the weather allowed of it. Twelve nights and eleven days we had been driving in the boat when old Mr. Rarx began to be delirious and to cry out to me to throw the gold overboard or it would sink us and we should all be lost. For days past the child had been declining and that was the great cause of his wildness. He had been over and over again shrieking out to me to give her all the remaining meat, to give her all the remaining rum, to save her at any cost, or we should all be ruined. At this time she lay in her mother's arms at my feet. One of her little hands was always creeping about her mother's neck or chin. I had watched the wasting of the little hand, and I knew it was nearly over. The old man's cries were so discordant with the mother's love and submission that I called out to him in an angry voice, unless he held his peace on the instant, I would order him to be knocked on the head and thrown overboard. He was mute then, until the child died, very peacefully, an hour afterwards, which was known to all in the boat by the mother's breaking out into lamentations for the first time since the wreck, for she had great fortitude and constancy, though she was a little gentlewoman. Old Mr. Rox then became quite ungovernable, tearing what rags he had on him, raging in imprecations, and calling to me that if I had thrown the gold overboard, always the gold with him, I might have saved the child. And now, says he in a terrible voice, we shall founder, and all go to the devil, for our sins will sink us when we have no innocent child to bear us up. We so discovered with amazement that this old wretch had only cared for the life of the pretty little creature dear to all of us, because of the influence he superstitiously hoped she might have in preserving him. Altogether it was too much for the smith or armorer who was sitting next the old man to bear. He took him by the throat and rolled him over the thwarts where he lay still enough for hours afterwards. All that thirteenth night Miss Colshaw, lying across my knees as I kept the helm, comforted and supported the poor mother. Her child, covered with a pea-jacket of mine, lay in her lap. It troubled me all night to think that there was no prayer-book among us, and that I could remember but very few of the exact words of the burial service. When I stood up at broad day, all knew what was going to be done, and I noticed that my poor fellows made the motion of uncovering their heads, though their heads had been stark bare to the sky and sea for many a weary hour. There was a long, heavy swell on, but otherwise it was a fair morning, and there were broad fields of sunlight on the waves in the east. I said no more than this. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. He raised the daughter of Jairus the ruler, and said she was not dead, but slept. He raised the widow's son. He arose himself, and was seen of many. He loved little children, saying, Suffer them to come unto me, and rebuke them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. In his name, my friends, and committed to his merciful goodness. With those words I laid my rough face softly on the placid little forehead and buried the golden Lucy in the grave of the golden Mary. Having had it on my mind to relate the end of this dear little child, I have omitted something from its exact place which I will supply here. It will come quite as well here as anywhere else. Foreseeing that if the boat lived through the storming weather, the time must come, and soon come, when we should have absolutely no morsel to eat, I had one momentous point often in my thoughts. Although I had, years before that, fully satisfied myself that the instances in which human beings in the last distress have fed upon each other are exceedingly few, and have very seldom indeed, if ever, occurred when the people in distress, however dreadful their extremity, have been accustomed to moderate forbearance and restraint. 
I say, though I had long before quite satisfied my mind on this topic, I felt doubtful whether there might not have been in former cases some harm and danger from keeping it out of sight and pretending not to think of it. I felt doubtful whether some minds growing weak with fasting and exposure, and having such a terrific idea to dwell upon in secret, might not magnify it until it got to have an awful attraction about it. This was not a new thought of mine, for it had grown out of my reading. However, it came over me stronger than it had ever done before, as it had reason for doing in the boat, and on the fourth day I decided that I would bring out into the light that unformed fear which must have been more or less darkly in every brain among us. Therefore, as a means of beguiling the time and inspiring hope, I gave them the best summary in my power of Bly's voyage of more than three thousand miles in an open boat after the mutiny of the bounty and of the wonderful preservation of that boat's crew they listened throughout with great interest and i concluded by telling them that in my opinion the happiest circumstance in the whole narrative was that bly who was no delicate man either had solemnly placed it on record therein that he was sure and certain that under no conceivable circumstances whatever would that emaciated party who had gone through all the pains of famine, have preyed on one another. I cannot describe the visible relief which this spread through the boat, and how the tears stood in every eye. From that time I was as well convinced as Bly himself that there was no danger, and that this phantom, at any rate, did not haunt us. Now it was a part of Bly's experience that when the people in his boat were more cast down, nothing did them so much good as hearing a story told by one of their number when i mentioned that i saw that it struck the general attention as much as it did my own for i had not thought of it until i came to it in my summary this was on the day after mrs atherfield first sang to us i proposed that whenever the weather would permit we should have a story two hours after dinner I always issued the allowance I have mentioned at one o'clock, and called it by that name, as well as our song at sunset. The proposal was received with a cheerful satisfaction that warmed my heart within me, and I do not say too much when I say that those two periods in the four and twenty hours were expected with positive pleasure and were really enjoyed by all hands specters as we soon were in our bodily wasting our imaginations did not perish like the gross flesh upon our bones music and adventure two of the great gifts of providence to mankind could charm us long after that was lost the wind was almost always against us after the second day and for many days together we could not nearly hold our own we had all varieties of bad weather we had rain, hail, snow, wind, mist, thunder, and lightning. Still the boats lived through the heavy seas, and still we perishing people rose and fell with the great waves. Sixteen nights and fifteen days, twenty nights and nineteen days, twenty-four nights and twenty-three days, so the time went on. Disheartening as I knew that our progress, or want of progress, must be, I never deceived them as to my calculations of it. In the first place I felt that we were all too near eternity for deceit. In the second place I knew that if I failed or died, the man who followed me must have a knowledge of the true state of things to begin upon. When I told them at noon what I reckoned we had made or lost, they generally received what I said in a tranquil and resigned manner, and always gratefully towards me. It was not unusual at any time of the day for someone to burst out weeping loudly without any new cause, and when the burst was over, to calm down a little better than before. I had seen exactly the same thing in a house of mourning. During the whole of this time, old Mr. Rark's had had his fits of calling out to me to throw the gold, always the gold, overboard, and of heaping 
violent reproaches upon me for not having saved the child. But now, the food being all gone, and I having nothing left to serve out but a bit of coffee-berry now and then, he began to be too weak to do this, and consequently fell silent. Mrs. Atherfield and Miss Colshaw generally lay, each with an arm across one of my knees, and her head upon it. They never complained at all. Up to the time of her child's death, Mrs. Atherfield had bound up her own beautiful hair every day, and I took particular notice that this was always before she sang her song at night when everyone looked at her. But she never did it after the loss of her darling, and it would have been now all tangled with dirt and wet, but that Miss Colshaw was careful of it long after she was herself, and would sometimes smooth it down with her weak, thin hands. We were past mustering a story now, but one day, at about this period, I reverted to the superstition of old Mr. Rocks concerning the golden Lucy, and told them that nothing vanished from the eye of God, though much might pass away from the eyes of men. We were all of us, says I, children once, and our baby feet have strolled in green woods ashore, and our baby hands have gathered flowers in gardens where the birds were singing. The children that we were are not lost to the great knowledge of our Creator. Those innocent creatures will appear with us before Him and plead for us. What we were in the best time of our generous youth will arise and go with us too. The purest part of our lives will not desert us at the pass to which all of us here present are gliding. What we were then will be as much in existence before him as what we are now. They were no less comforted by this consideration than I was to myself, and Miss Colshaw, drawing my ear nearer to her lip, said, Captain Ravender, I was on my way to marry a disgraced and broken man whom I dearly loved when he was honourable and good. Your words seem to have come out of my own poor heart. She pressed my hand upon it, smiling. Twenty-seven nights and twenty-six days. We were in no want of rain-water, but we had nothing else. And yet even now I never turned my eyes upon a waking face, but it tried to brighten before mine. Oh, what a thing it is, in a time of danger and in the presence of death, the shining of a face upon a face. I have heard it broached that orders should be given in great new ships by electric telegraph. I admire machinery as much as any man, and am as thankful to it as any man can be for what it does for us. But it will never be a substitute for the face of a man with his soul in it, encouraging another man to be brave and true. Never try it for that it will break down like a straw. I now began to remark certain changes in myself which I did not like. They caused me much disquiet. I often saw the golden Lucy in the air above the boat. I often saw her I have spoken of before sitting beside me. I saw the golden Mary go down as she really had gone down twenty times in a day, and yet the sea was mostly, to my thinking, not sea neither, but moving country, and extraordinary mountainous regions, the like of which have never been beheld. I felt it time to leave my last words regarding John Steadyman, in case any lips should last out to repeat them to any living ears. I said that John had told me, as he had on deck, that he had sung out, Breakers ahead, the instant they were audible, and had tried to wear ship but she struck before it could be done. His cry, I dare say, had made my dream. I said that the circumstances were altogether without warning and out of any course that could have been guarded against, that the same loss would have happened if I had been in charge, and that John was not to blame, but from first to last had done his duty nobly, like the man he was. I tried to write it down in my pocket-book, but could make no words, though I knew what the words were that I wanted to make. 
when it had come to that her hands though she was dead so long laid me down gently in the bottom of the boat and she and the golden lucy swung me to sleep all that follows was written by john steadyman chief mate on the twenty-sixth day after the foundering of the golden mary at sea i john steadyman was sitting in my place in the stern sheets of the surf boat with just sense enough left in me to steer that is to say with my eyes strained wide awake over the bows of the boat and my brains fast asleep and dreaming when i was roused upon a sudden by our second mate mr william rames let me take a spell in your place says he and look you out for the long boat astern the last time she rose on the crest of a wave i thought i made out a signal flying aboard her we shifted our places clumsily and slowly enough for we were both of us weak and dazed with wet cold and hunger i waited some time watching the heavy rollers astern before the long boat rose atop of one of them at the same time with us at last she was heaved up for a moment well in view and there sure enough was the signal flying aboard of her a strip of rag of some sort rigged to an oar and hoisted in her bows what does it mean says rames to me in a quavering trembling sort of voice do they signal a sail in sight hush for god's sake says i clapping my hand over his mouth don't let the people hear you they'll all go mad together if we mislead them about that signal wait a bit till i have another look at it i held on by him for he had set me all of a tremble with his notion of a sail in sight and watched for the long boat again up she rose on the top of another roller i made out the signal clearly that second time and saw that it was rigged half-mast high rames says i it's a signal of distress pass the word forward to keep her before the sea and no more we must get the long-boat within hailing distance of us as soon as possible i dropped down into my old place at the tiller without another word for the thought went through me like a knife that something had happened to captain ravender i should consider myself unworthy to write another line of this statement if i had not made up my mind to speak the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and i must therefore confess plainly that now for the first time my heart sank within me this weakness on my part was produced in some degree as i take it by the exhausting effects of previous anxiety and grief our provisions if i may give that name to what we had left were reduced to the rind of one lemon and about a couple of handfuls of coffee berries besides these great distresses caused by the death the danger and the suffering among my crew and passengers i had had a little distress of my own to shake me still more in the death of the child whom i had got to be very fond of on the voyage out so fond that i was secretly a little jealous of her being taken in the long-boat instead of mine when the ship foundered it used to be a great comfort to me and i think to those with me also after we had seen the last of the golden mary to see the golden lucy held up by the men in the long-boat when the weather allowed it as the best and brightest sight they had to show she looked at the distance we saw her from almost like a little white bird in the air to miss her for the first time when the weather lulled a little again and we all looked out for our white bird and looked in vain was a sore disappointment to see the men's heads bowed down and the captain's hand pointing into the sea when we hailed the long-boat a few days after gave me as heavy a shock and as sharp a pang of heartache to bear as ever i remember suffering in all my life i only mention these things to show that if i did give way a little at first under the dread that our captain was lost to us it was not without having been a good deal shaken beforehand by more trials of one sort of another than often fall to one man's share i had got over the choking in my throat with the help of a drop of water 
and had steadied my mind again so as to be prepared against the worst, when I heard the hail, Lord help the poor fellows, how weak it sounded, Surf boat, ahoy! I looked up, and there were our companions, in misfortune tossing abreast of us, not so near that we could make out the features of any of them, but near enough with some exertion for people in our condition to make their voices heard in the intervals when the wind was weakest. I answered the hail and waited a bit and heard nothing, and then sung out the captain's name. The voice that replied did not sound like his. The words that reached us were, Chief mate wanted on board. Every man of my crew knew what that meant as well as I did. As second officer in command, there could be but one reason for wanting me on board the longboat. A groan went all round us, and my men looked darkly in each other's faces and whispered under their breaths, The captain is dead. I commanded them to be silent, and not to make too much of bad news at such a pass as things had now come to with us. Then, hailing the longboat, I signified that I was ready to go on board when the weather would let me, stopped a bit to draw a good long breath, and then called out as loud as I could the dreadful question, Is the captain dead? The black figures of three or four men in the after part of the longboat all stooped down together as my voice reached them. They were lost to view for about a minute, then appeared again, one man among them was held up on his feet by the rest, and he hailed back the blessed words. A very faint hope went a very long way with people in our desperate situation. Not yet! The relief felt by me and by all with me when we knew that our captain, the one fitted for duty, was not lost to us. It is not in words, at least not in such words as a man like me can command, to express. I did my best to cheer the men by telling them what a good sign it was that we were not as badly off yet as we had feared, and then communicated what instructions I had to give to William Rames, who was to be left in command in my place when I took charge of the longboat. After that there was nothing to be done but to wait for the chance of the wind dropping at sunset and the sea going down afterwards, so as to enable our weak crews to lay the two boats alongside of each other without undue risk, or to put it plainer, without saddling ourselves with the necessity for an extraordinary exertion of strength or skill. Both the one and the other had now been starved out of us for days and days together. At sunset the wind suddenly dropped but the sea, which had been running high for so long a time past, took hours after that before it showed any signs of getting to rest. The moon was shining, the sky was wonderfully clear, and it could not have been, according to my calculations, far off midnight when the long, slow, regular swell of the calming ocean fairly set in, and I took the responsibility of lessening the distance between the longboat and ourselves. It was, I dare say, a delusion of mine, but I thought I had never seen the moon shine so white and ghastly anywhere, either on sea or on land, as she shone that night while we were approaching our companions in misery. When there was not much more than a boat's length between us, and the white light streamed cold and clear over all our faces, both crews rested on their oars with one great shudder, and stared over the gunwale of either boat, panic-stricken at the first sight of each other. "'Any lives lost among you?' I asked, in the midst of that frightful silence. The men in the long-boat huddled together like sheep at the sound of my voice. "'None yet but the child, thanks be to God,' answered one among them, and at the sound of his voice all my men shrank together like the men in the long-boat. I was afraid to let the horror produced by our first meeting at close quarters after the dreadful changes that wet, cold, and famine had produced last one moment longer 
than could be helped. So, without giving time for any more questions and answers, I commanded the men to lay the two boats close alongside of each other. When I rose up and committed the tiller to the hands of Rames, all my poor fellows raised their white faces imploringly to mine. Don't leave us, sir, they said, don't leave us. I leave you, says I, under the command and the guidance of Mr. William Rames, as good a sailor as I am, and as trusty and kind a man as ever stepped. Do your duty by him, as you have done it by me, and remember to the last that while there is life there is hope. God bless and help you all. With these words I collected what strength I had left, and caught at two arms that were held out to me, and so got from the stern sheets of one boat into the stern sheets of the other. "'Mind where you step, sir,' whispered one of the men who had helped me into the longboat. I looked down as he spoke. Three figures were huddled up below me, with the moonshine falling on them in ragged streaks through the gaps between the men standing or sitting above them. The first face I made out was the face of Miss Colshaw. Her eyes were wide open and fixed on me. She seemed still to keep her senses, and by the alternate parting and closing of her eyes to be trying to speak, but I could not hear that she uttered a single word. On her shoulder rested the head of Mrs. Atherfield. The mother of our poor little golden Lucy must, I think, have been dreaming of the child she had lost, for there was a faint smile just ruffling the white stillness of her face. When I first saw it turn upward, with peaceful, closed eyes towards the heavens, from her I looked down a little, and there, with her head on her lap, and with one of her hands resting tenderly on his cheek, there lay the captain, to whose help and guidance up to this miserable time we had never looked in vain. There, worn out at last in our service, and for our sakes, lay the best and bravest man of all our company. I stole my hand in gently through his clothes, and laid it on his heart, and felt a little feeble warmth over it, though my cold, dulled touch could not detect even the faintest beating. The two men in the stern sheets with me, noticing what I was doing, knowing I loved him like a brother, and seeing, I suppose, more distress in my face than I myself was conscious of its showing, lost command over themselves altogether, and burst into a piteous moaning, sobbing lamentation over him. One of the two drew aside a jacket from his feet, and showed me that they were bare, except where a wet, ragged strip of stocking still clung to one of them. When the ship struck the iceberg, he had run on deck, leaving his shoes in his cabin. All through the voyage in the boat his feet had been unprotected, and not a soul had discovered it until he dropped. As long as he could keep his eyes open, the very look of them had cheered the men, and comforted and upheld the women. Not one living creature in the boat, with any sense about him, but had felt the good influence of that brave man in one way or another. Not one but had heard him over and over again give the credit to others which was due only to himself, praising this man for patience, and thanking that man for help, when the patience and the help had really and truly, as to the best part of both, come only from him. All this and much more I heard pouring confusedly from the men's lips while they crouched down sobbing and crying over their commander and wrapping the jacket as warmly and tenderly as they could over his cold feet. It went to my heart to check them, but I knew that if this lamenting spirit spread any further all chance of keeping alight any last sparks of hope and resolution among the boat's company would be lost for ever. Accordingly I sent them to their places, spoke a few encouraging words to the men forward, promising to serve out when the morning came as much as I dared of any eatable thing left in the lockers, called to Rames in my old boat to keep as near us as he safely could, drew the garments and coverings of the two poor suffering women more closely about them, and 
with a secret prayer to be directed for the best in bearing the awful responsibility now laid on my shoulders, took my captain's vacant place at the helm of the longboat. This, as well as I can tell, is the full and true account of how I came to be placed in charge of the lost passengers and crew of the Golden Mary on the morning of the twenty-seventh day after the ship struck the iceberg and foundered at sea. End of section two. Recording by James Carson. End of Wreck of the Golden Mary by Charles Dickens.